Welcome to Scripture Central. We're thrilled to have you here. Just a quick note, this video is a revamped edition of this video series from four years ago. The content, however, is as relevant and insightful as ever. We also invite you to explore our extensive collection of resources and programs designed to enhance your study of the scriptures. You can do this by visiting scripturecentral.org. Now, let's dive into the lesson. So, as we embark on a a study of this incredible book, the very first page you come to is this title page. Now, let's be honest, how many of you have had the experience of saying, I'm going to read the Book of Mormon? So you open it up, and then you come to this title page, and you almost get a feeling of, uh, I have to just kind of slog my way through this, this introductory material in order to get to the scriptures. In order to get to the good stuff, First Nephi chapter 1. Have any of you ever had that experience? Here's the question. Where did we get this title page from? Who wrote it? What's, what is its significance? Why should we care about the title page? If you look at the, in the beginning part, it says, The Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon upon plates taken from the plates of Nephi. So when we start asking this question of who wrote it, where did we get it from, you could, you could begin to surmise that perhaps it was Mormon who wrote the title page. There's at the very bottom it says translated by Joseph Smith Jr. You could say, hmm, maybe Joseph and Oliver Cowdery created the title page. But one of our early sources, uh, a journal entry from an individual who spoke with Joseph, gives us this insight that Joseph told him that the title page was translated off of the plates, that it, this, these two paragraphs are not created by Joseph nor Oliver, that they're actually translated, and it went one step further to say that it was taken from the very last leaf of the unsealed portion of the plates, which means it was the final thing likely to be written written before the plates were buried in the Hill Cumorah. And if you look a little closer into the title page, you'll notice things like paragraph 2 starts with an abridgment taken from the Book of Ether also. There's one person who did the abridgment to the Book of Ether and he was all alone when he did it, and his name was Moroni. Now, what does that mean? That, that means that it seems that Mormon did all of this work, gave the plates to his son Moroni, who then finished off chapters 8 and 9 in the book called Mormon, then he opens up the book of Ether and he abridges Ether, and then he writes his own little book called the book of Moroni, and when he's all finished, he now writes on the very last leaf the title page. This is what is in this book. Why is that significant? Because now you could look at the title page as if you're reading Moroni chapter 11. It's the last thing he wrote. It's the thing that comes after chapter 10. It was intended to be this, this introduction to this book, and who better to write it than the man who's finishing the book, and he knows everything start to finish that's contained in the book. Now, uh, as you embark on a study of the Book of Mormon, keep in mind that uh, President Ezra Taft Benson, clear back in 1988, said this, the Book of Mormon is the instrument that God designed to sweep the earth as with a flood to gather out his elect. This isn't just another book. This isn't just history. This isn't just a nice uh, quote book of, of nice statements that you can share in talks and in lessons. Two years before that, 1986, President Benson said this, there is a power in the book which will begin to flow into your lives the moment you begin a serious study of the book. You will find greater power to resist temptation. You will find the power to avoid deception. 
you will find the power to stay on the straight and narrow path. Pretty amazing promise that you don't have to read chapters and hundreds of pages in order to start feeling a difference in your life. He said, the moment you begin a serious study of this book, you're going to feel that power come into your life. Now, our witness today is that power can begin on page one because you're reading scripture written by Moroni, translated by Joseph, and now brought to us today. In fact, I like looking at these two paragraphs not just as paragraphs. I like looking at them as verse 1 and verse 2, even though they're not labeled as such. To me, they're scripture and it changes the way I look at them and the way I engage with them and read them. Now, when you go to a title page, traditionally in a book, you expect to have some questions answered. Who is this book about? What is this book about? When? Where? How? And my favorite of the questions, why? Why should I care to read this book? Give me, give me some reason to pull me in to, to actually engage with the book. That's what a title page uh, can do. That's how it functions. So, notice in the very first line of this first paragraph, wherefore it is. In other words, we're answering that question. What is it? It is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also of the Lamanites. So you now know that this is not a complete history book of the, this thousand year period. It's just an abridgment. We're getting excerpts through that, uh, through that time period of this people. You'll notice who. It was the Nephites and the Lamanites. And it's written to the Lamanites who are a remnant of the house of Israel and also to Jew and Gentile. So we know who it was about. We now know to whom it is addressed. And he included everybody in that. The primary or the principal audience is the Lamanites, but it's to Jew and Gentile, which takes up everybody in the world today. It's written how? By way of commandment and also by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation. Brothers and sisters, this changes things. When you understand that the Book of Mormon isn't simply a bunch of compilations from various diaries or journals that people just were keeping haphazardly through this thousand year history, when you realize that it was actually a commandment that God gave each of those groups of people at those various times to record their history and to record their preachings and their prophesying and the, the, the way that the Lord was dealing with those people in various circumstances, it changes the way we engage with this book. Notice it was written and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord that they might not be destroyed, to come forth by the gift and power of God unto the interpretation thereof. Once again, you know it was Moroni who wrote the, the final chapters of Moroni 1 through 10, then this title page, then he seals it up and he's going to be the one to bury it in the Hill Cumorah sealed by the hand of Moroni and hid up unto the Lord to come forth in due time by way of the Gentile. The interpretation thereof by the gift of God. Can you picture Moroni? He speaks, his, his verbal language is a reformed Hebrew and his written language is a reformed Egyptian. He knows that there's no chance anybody's going to be able to read this book. It, it's, it's chicken scratch to everybody but him and those writers who have come before him in this Nephite nation. And he recognizes that it's going to take a miracle. It's going to, to take the gift of God given to somebody in order to make sense of what's written on these plates. And I love the fact that he tells you that at the, the bottom of verse 1. 
the interpretation thereof by the gift of God. This is not going to make sense to anybody unless God helps that person do the work. This Gentile who's going to bring this work forth the way he, he describes it there. Most of those questions have been answered in paragraph one, and now we get paragraph two where the focus is going to be on why. Why do I need a Book of Mormon when I already have a Bible? Why do I need this, this record from the Nephites and the Lamanites over in the New World? Why should I engage with it? Watch as Moroni engages us with that uh, question and gives us a, a series of answers. First of all, he, he continues a little bit more about the what is it. It includes an abridgment taken from the book of Ether also, which is a record of the people of Jared who were scattered at the time the Lord confounded the language of the people when they were building a tower to get to heaven, which is to show, now here we go, unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers. So, he wants us to read this book so that when we look back through the history of time, we can see great things that God has done for people at various phases. Why? Why would he care that we know how good, how kind, how merciful God has been in the past? Isn't it interesting? Moroni is inviting you to look into the past. But he told us in his writing that he was looking to the future. He was looking to our day. He was seeing our, our situation and he was writing directly to us. So, this corridor of time, we, we do this crisscross and he's saying, I've seen your day and I've seen God's goodness in your day and I've seen the struggles that you're facing in your day and you will be greatly benefited by looking into the past and recognizing uh, the hand of God in all of these things so that it makes your, your eye more capable of seeing his hand in your own world, in your own life, in your own circle of influence in the latter days. Notice the second uh, why, and that they may know the covenants of the Lord. He, he wants us to, to discover what God on high has promised to men and women on the earth. What, what, is, what has he promised? What has he bound himself by covenant to do? One of the things I love about the title page of the Book of Mormon is Moroni's invitation for us to learn about God's covenants, to know that the Book of Mormon is a witness of God's covenants that we can be brought back into his presence. Now, there are many covenants we could talk about, the covenant of baptism, the covenant of sacrament. What I'd like to focus on just briefly are two of the most important covenants that show up in the Old Testament, which Moroni and the Book of Mormon writers would have been very familiar with. I wanna cast your mind back to Genesis chapter 12, and that is the introduction to the Abrahamic covenant. If you look at verses one through three, that is where God offers Abraham and his posterity and all the world incredible promises. So you might want to pause now, just go back and look at those verses. Remind yourself what God has bound himself to do for you. So two of the most important covenants that you should be aware of in the Bible are the Abrahamic covenant, and you can see that initiated in Genesis chapter 12. And this is God's duties and his promises to Abraham and his posterity, which actually includes all people around the world. Then we have the Mosaic Covenant that's probably best summarized in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. This is what we promise to do. It's our duties. And if we keep those commandments or any update to those commandments a revelation that God has given by subsequent prophets or by modern day prophets, we get full access to the free gift that God promised us through the Abrahamic promises. And the summary statement for the Mosaic Covenant that you can look for throughout scriptures, and particularly in the Book of Mormon, is if you keep the commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. 
The summary statement you will look for for the Abrahamic covenant throughout scriptures is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God who does great things. He keeps his promises. The scriptures are written and preserved as a witness of all that God has done to bless our lives and to be there for us, to open the path of our salvation. The scriptures were also written to instruct us on our covenantal duties. So if you pay attention as you're reading through the Book of Mormon this year, you can look for what evidence do I have of God's characteristics and his trustworthiness and the great things that he has done for his people. And then you can also look for what does God ask of me? I know what God does for me. What does he want in return? And you might just throughout your study this year look for those two things. What do I learn about God and what do I learn about his duties? Those are two of the most important covenants we can look for. And as Moroni says on the title page, the Book of Mormon was preserved to remind us of these two great covenants so we can follow the covenant path. Let me pause here and ask a, a simple question that's, that's not directly related, but it's very, it's tangential to what we're talking about here. Do any of you know what the most frequently asked question here in, uh, in Provo, Utah happens to be? And I know this is, this is specific to this geographic location, but any of you aware? Um, the answer is, or the, the question that is asked more frequently in Provo than any other is so ubiquitous that we even put it on the mountain, and it's been there for decades. The question is, why? It's on our mountain, it's on our football field, it's on our basketball court, it's on uh, hats and shirts. Everywhere you turn, you're being confronted with or asked this question, why? Now, uh, this isn't a play on words, it's a play on a letter in this case. But that's a really, really profound question to face everywhere you, you look. Why? Because if you can answer that, you're no longer going to go through the motions. You're no longer going to be just robotic in, in your discipleship. If you can answer the, the question, why, you now know what the purpose is for why you're doing the things that you're doing. You don't just do the right things anymore. You do the right things for the right reasons, which leads to greater spiritual growth, which leads to you actually becoming more like the Savior because you see, you see the, the end goal. You, you know why you're living those elements of the gospel. And the more of those questions you can answer, then you very soon become wise. Another silly play on words. The more of the why you can answer, the wiser you become. The, the more purposeful life becomes. The more meaningful your scripture study becomes. No longer are you opening up the Book of Mormon in order to read for a certain number of minutes to check a box to say, okay, I did my reading for today, which is good. It's not a bad thing to read the Book of Mormon for any reason. But as President Oaks would say, there's good, then there's better, and then there's best. Uh, the best is when we dive into our scripture study with deep purpose and deep meaning and, and search out the why. So we've started with the first two answers to this question of why the Book of Mormon. First one is, he says, we want you to see God's, God's hand, his goodness in the past, to know of all of those, those amazing great things which God hath done for their fathers. And the second was what Taylor's been talking about, that we might know the covenants of the Lord. 
that he doesn't want these covenants to be isolated for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, all the world. In fact, the scripture that is repeated as many times in, in all of the, the Bible, both Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, comes from Genesis 22, that promise to Abraham that through your seed, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people of the earth will be blessed. How will they be blessed? Through the covenant given to Abraham. And then the, the combination of the, the covenant on, on Mount Sinai as well added to that, and then taken out to the whole world through our scriptures. It's beautiful. And now for the third reason why we need the Book of Mormon, that they are not cast off forever. So it's this, it's this sub reason, it, it, it's a tag on to the covenant. Look at the wording there carefully, that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever. It's, it goes with this covenant that God has not forsaken you and he's not cast you off forever. Now, if you look at that phrase and you consider who wrote it, it becomes a lot more meaningful. Of all of the prophets through the entire history of the Book of Mormon, the one who could scratch those, those characters into those golden plates with the most authenticity and the most meaning and depth of feeling has to be Moroni. Think about it. In 401 AD, he tells us that he remains all alone all alone. His, his father, his family have all been killed, his nation has been destroyed, and he's left to tell this sad tale all alone. And here he's telling you that one of the reasons we need this book is to know the covenants that were not cast off forever. Now here's a guy who knew the covenants, and he could feel pretty discouraged and pretty down, feel pretty cast off, left, left alone forever, but he's the one telling you and me in the latter days, you're not cast off. Uh, there is a God who has promised some things and he's very good at keeping his promises. He will not cast you off forever if just come to him. Then you'll notice the fourth reason and also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that's everybody, that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. This is so beautiful that the reason we need the Book of Mormon is to help convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he manifests himself to all nations this is a beautiful element of the Book of Mormon as this second witness to the Bible, that it's not just for the Jews in Jerusalem or in the, the old world, it's also for scattered Israelites and those who are with them in the new world, and then in our latter days, that message now goes to both Jew and Gentile. Notice how he concludes this. Now, if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men. Uh, it's Moroni who in Ether chapter 12 spends a lot of time talking about his weakness in writing and about how the, the latter-day Gentiles are going to mock him because of his weakness in writing and the Lord tells him that he'll make uh, weak things become strong. These are not God's mistakes. These are, these are human weakness that might come through in this record. Notice his conclusion, wherefore, condemn not the things of God that ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. I think it's interesting that the very last thing that Moroni wrote is that ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. That's his, that's his closure, it seems. If this if this is on the last leaf, which we're told it was. The bottom line 
of the Book of Mormon is Moroni wants us to be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. Hmm. It's almost as if all, all of these whys here are intended for the ultimate why. It's for you to be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, how in the world can reading a book and learning these things help me to be spotless? It's not in the reading of the book that that happens. It's in the reading of the book that we have the Lord Jesus Christ revealed that his goodness is manifest, that his covenants become clear, that all of a sudden we feel some things, we understand some things, we connect some dots that haven't been connected before, and all of a sudden we have a reason to, to repent. We have a reason to increase our faith in Christ. We have a reason to move forward on the covenant path with greater trust in him than we've ever had before. And as we make this serious study of the book, President Benson's promise, there is a power in the book which will begin to flow into your lives the moment you begin a serious study of it. It now starts to take root in our soul and we actually change our life, which then over that course of, of a lifetime of relying on the Lord Jesus Christ, his infinite mercy, his merits, his grace, he is the one who makes us spotless. We don't, we don't do this cleansing process on our own. It's this beautiful interaction between us and the God who was sent to save us. That is the reason we need a Book of Mormon sitting next side by side with the Bible, the second witness, to, to help us on that journey. Let's return now to the top of the title page. It says, The Book of Mormon. Now, it's very important to know that in ancient Hebrew, ancient Israelite writings, the scribes would often use names, the meaning of the name, as the lesson, as a key principle, a key thesis. Now, if we apply this to the Book of Mormon, because the writers come out of an ancient Near Eastern environment, and the Book of Mormon is an authentic ancient witness for Jesus Christ, the word Mormon is and should be very significant. Now, I'll just point out that Mormon probably comes from two Egyptian words, mor, which might be related to the word Mary, which means love, and the Egyptian word for enduring or everlasting. So the word Mormon would mean love endures forever. And whose love are we talking about? It's the love of God. It's the whole point of the Book of Mormon. So when we look at the title page, we actually can hear the entire purpose of the Book of Mormon, if we could translate it back into the Egyptian, the, the name Mormon, and we could actually translate the title as the Book of God's Love Endures Forever. Now, as you embark in this study, in your study of the Book of Mormon, we invite you to consider how that thesis statement, how the meaning of the title of the Book of Mormon, how that pervades the totality of the Book of Mormon. We invite you to look for how God's love endures forever. Look for examples as you're reading of how God's love is everlasting, how it endures forever. And then we invite you to document for yourself in your own life how God love endures forever. Because the stories that we have here are people that are just like you. At some point they were alive and they had hopes and dreams and worries and concerns and weaknesses, but they learned through personal experience that God's love endures forever. And they documented those stories of their lives of how God's love endures forever for others. And we encourage you to do the same. And not because your book will be buried and be brought forth in some future time, but because those stories will matter to you 
and to those you love. So again, just this invitation to know the power of the Book of Mormon may be summed up by the meaning of Mormon's name. Let me just share my witness briefly that the Book of Mormon is an ancient, authentic witness of Jesus Christ. And one example that is an ancient, authentic witness of Jesus Christ is that the title page was found on the last leaf of the plates. Now, if we consider in Joseph Smith's day, if somebody was writing a book and they wanted to provide a summary or an introduction to the book, where would they place it? They would place it at the front of the book, not on the last leaf. But if you were an ancient Israelite scribe, or if you've been trained, as the Nephite writers had, in the ancient Israelite scribal tradition, you would place the summary of your book on the last leaf. That was how things were done. So again, as evidence that the Book of Mormon is an ancient, authentic witness of Jesus Christ, we have right there at the title page that it was the last leaf and it was written as a summary just as an ancient Israelite scribe would and should have done. So as you read the Book of Mormon, consider how these ancient people are authentically witnessing to us today that Jesus is the Christ for us. I have here a replica. It's an 1830 replica copy of the Book of Mormon. So the original edition was printed by E.B. Grandin's print shop from, from August of 1829 through March of 1830 when it completed. 5,000 copies of a book that would have looked a lot like this cost $3,000. Martin Harris provided the, uh, the financing for that. If you open up one of the 1830 edition, the very first thing you see is that title page that we've just covered. The next thing you see is a description of the copyright that Joseph Smith Jr. held for this book. And then you get this preface that we don't have in any of our modern editions of the Bible, with, or of the Book of Mormon, which is where Joseph Smith is describing what happened very briefly with the lost 116 pages, and then it jumps right into 1 Nephi chapter 1. In our current edition of the Book of Mormon, the next thing after the title page is the introduction. This introduction was added in the 1981 edition. So it wasn't written by Joseph Smith or Oliver Cowdery. It wasn't translated from the plates. It wasn't inscribed by Mormon or Moroni. It was, it was added in 1981 as an, as an introduction to this book. Let me give you an example of, of the fluid nature of the introduction. So if you look at a 1981 edition of the Book of Mormon, like mine is, at the bottom of the second paragraph, it tells you that this group is known as the Jaredites, and after thousands of years, all were destroyed except the Lamanites. They are the principal ancestors of the American Indians. Since 1981, the church and, and the archaeologists and other scholars found all kinds of other evidence to suggest that the New World was not just occupied by the Jaredites, the Nephites, and the Lamanites, and the Mulekites, but there were a lot of people over here. And so they changed the, the wording in the bottom of that second paragraph. It no longer says they are the principal ancestors of the American Indians. It says they are among the ancestors of the American Indians. God had brought many people over to the New World, pre-Columbian. Pre the thing that makes this particular group or these groups unique, the Jaredites, the Nephites, is that they were literate and they kept records and they are able to record the history in, in a manner on plates that could be preserved and carry their message forward through time so that we could have access to it. If you look at paragraph 6 in the introduction, they're quoting the prophet Joseph here. I love this statement in paragraph 6. I told the brethren, 
that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. You'll notice he didn't say a person could get nearer to God by reading this book. He said you get closer to God by abiding by the precepts in this book. The Book of Mormon is the most self-aware book of Scripture that you're ever going to find. It's constantly addressing you, the reader. It's, it's very self-aware of, of how it is being uh, produced by those ancient writers. Who's writing? Who's getting the plates next? What is their intent? What is their purpose for writing what they're writing? Uh, it is constantly engaging us with the process of how it is being put together, why it is being created, and how you and I can benefit from it. I love the fact that, that the prophet Joseph is telling us that if you really want to get near to God, read it, but don't stop there. Abide by the precepts that you learn in this book, which then leads to the invitation in paragraph 8. We invite all men everywhere to read the Book of Mormon, to ponder in their hearts the message it contains, and then to ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if the book is true. And those who pursue this course and ask in faith will gain a testimony of its truth and divinity by the power of the Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, what an amazing thing that you don't have to take our word for it. You don't have to take Joseph's word for it. You don't have to rely on other people. God's invitation through this, this book that has been prepared to, to uh, gather the elect out of the four corners of the earth in the latter days, his invitation is, ask him directly. Don't put anyone between you and God in seeking truth regarding this book. Go straight to the source himself and ask him. But you have to ask him with real intent that you, you really are going to act on the revelation that comes with faith in Christ. And notice in the, in the ninth paragraph there, those who gain this divine witness from the Holy Spirit will also come to know by the same power that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that Joseph Smith is his revelator and prophet in these last days, and that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's kingdom once again established on the earth, preparatory to the second coming of the Messiah. That now leads us to the testimony of the three witnesses, the eight, and then Joseph Smith's own testimony. In the 1830 edition of the, the Book of Mormon, you'll notice that at the very end, after Moroni 10 finishes, it says the end, then you get the testimony of the three witnesses, and then you turn it over and you get the testimony of the eight witnesses. So, that's the original as, as it came forth. Now, we get the benefit of having the testimony of the three witnesses, and then the eight, and then Joseph Smith. You add those up, you get the number 12, which is a beautiful uh, Hebrew number that can symbolize a, a whole series of things, but among them, it can represent authority and power, and uh, the twelve tribes of Israel. These are, it, it, it can be this message of the, the twelve are going to go out and gather all of God's children into the house of Israel, into, into this family where salvation can be found. Now, the three witnesses experience some amazing spiritual blessings. An angel appears to them, shows them the plates, they hear the voice of God from heaven bearing witness of the Book of Mormon's truthfulness, a table appears next to, to the angel, and on the table they then see the Urim and Thummim, the Liahona, the Sword of Laban, the uh, breastplate. They, they see all of these amazing things associated with the Book of Mormon and they're able to testify to the world that they know. And even though all three of them at one point or another are going to leave the church, 
Martin and Oliver come back, David Whitmer never does, even though they leave the church, they never once go back on their testimony of the Book of Mormon. They never deny what they knew and what they had experienced from the, the angel and seeing the plates and these, these elements and hearing the voice of God. That testimony stays firm to, the, to their dying day in all three cases. The eight witnesses, they have a much more physical experience. Joseph Smith is, is given permission to show them the plates and they are able to heft them, they're able to hold them and feel them and turn the, the page, the leaves on those, uh, of those plates. And it's a very physical, tangible experience and they bear witness and none of them ever go back on their witness of the book. And Joseph Smith's testimony is compiled by uh, by the church, some of the statements that he had made about the miraculous coming forth of the Book of Mormon, telling his story, and you'll notice he never went back on his testimony. He gave his life for this work that, that uh, he started, or that the Lord started through him. Now here's the question, which one is the most important, important witness of the book. Uh, we would suggest to you that the whole reason for these testimonies is simply a means to the end of you being able to gain your own witness of the, test of, of the Book of Mormon. That's the most important witness, that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. And it doesn't matter how many million people in the world can say they know the book is true until you can stand and say that you've gained your own witness. And so as we go through our study of the, the Book of Mormon with you, it's our prayer that the, everything we say, everything you experience will be so that your own testimony can be strengthened or in some cases born and in other cases strengthened and solidified and developed in breadth and depth as you move forward on that covenant path. So I just want to add my witness to the long list of witnesses that have come before and to the, to the many witnesses that will come hereafter, that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. It is true. It was translated by the gift and power of God. It was written by way of commandment and revelation and the spirit of prophecy by these people, and it will change your life. President Henry B. Iron gave an entire talk once called The Book of Mormon Will Change Your Life. And here's the amazing thing. From my own experience, I have found that promise to be absolutely true over and over and over again. It just keeps changing my life as I grow line upon line, precept upon precept, as I, as I study again and again and again. I learn more about the Savior and in the process I learn more about myself and my loved ones and those around me. And it, it changes the way I think and it changes the way I live and I love the Savior with all my heart and that love has come to me in large part due to an intense study of the scriptures and especially in particular the Book of Mormon which is another testament of Jesus Christ. I want to add a second witness. I love the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon in my mind is the most literarily beautiful, doctrinally truthful, and everlastingly applicable book the world has ever seen. We encourage you as you embark on your study of the Book of Mormon to feel God's love that's been so lovingly preserved over the ages and now available to us in the Book of Mormon. Know that you're loved. <laughs>